Well, welcome. Thanks so much for, uh, for waiting and for bearing with us. Um, now the expectation hope, uh, probably have to risen a bit too much, but what I want to do today is to talk a little bit about a topic that I've been researching or working on for a couple of, of, of years. Um, my name is Florian Malzacher. I'm a curator in, mainly in the field of theater, so not so much in performing arts, uh, in, in visual arts. So also I, the examples I will talk about, the artistic examples, are... Um, coming more from the field of theater or from the in-between between theater and visual art, I would say. And um, I was very happy about the invitation by Insta and Sanya Bogera uh, to do this here because uh, the idea that the question of theater as assembly, the questions of assemblies in art, are of course very much related to what is happening at Documenta. And at the same time, uh, I think often it's a bit like a different strand. So my examples also come very much from a, from a Western, European, Anglo-American context uh, with, with some examples, so it's not so clear line. But uh, I feel like, like a lot of the developments that are seen here also uh, are quite are parallel, but often very separated. And, and of course, sometimes they interlink. So, I, uh, so it's also great to be here and to see how these things actually resonate with each other or have di completely different uh, strands where they come from. Um, so I will bring some examples that are not present at Documenta uh, and, and, yeah, and talk about them and, and show them. Um, maybe to briefly say something about the, why this is theater that I'm going to talk about, which might be um, not for everybody completely obvious. So. I was very interested in the question of what political theater can be today. And one can say that the, um, that the notion of political theater has changed over the years, obviously, like, uh, like all notions do. But there was a time, in, especially in Western theater, but also in Eastern European theater, in the, let's say mainly in the 70s and 80s, where political theater was very much defined by content. So the form of the theater would be whatever form it has, depending on the director or the theater, uh, but then it would talk about political issues. So that was a political theater, and I think often it was very powerful, it produced scandals and so on, so it was it's not to dismiss it, but, uh, uh, and, uh, but I think this kind of form is still by many considered to be the kind of political theater, why it also might, might look a bit old-fashioned to do it. So you, you have actors on stage and then you... you, you, you uh, deliberate political issues or produce a scandal or whatever. Uh, so the focus was very much on the what, to simplify it, less on the how. So it was less about what would be the means, what, as, what aesthetics do you need actually to, to have a political performance? What is the relationship with the audience when you talk about pol politics? Is it, is it a good relationship to have it like we have at the moment? Uh, what kind of politics is behind it uh, if you just speak to an audience. So there was a wave of uh, theater makers in the 90s and early 2000s, of course with uh, predecessors uh, in the decades before, uh, but, the, but there was quite a wave uh, in the 90s and early 2000s um, connected with the term, later coined term, post-dramatic theater 
in, in dance, it would be also conceptual dance uh, that, that came in, that then would put the focus very much on the, on the aesthetics, on the, on the how in a way. So, so as an answer to, to this content-driven uh, focus. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, t texts, um, uh, yeah, uh, like, like a lot of, like, like a lot of um, negotiation in this time, discourse in this time would, would say very much that the, the political as generally has to be looked for in the, in the aesthetics, left bit, it's, it's, um, uh, so the political, the, the political is in the how and not in the what. So that was kind of a counter, counter reaction to that. Uh, and um, I'm not going to, into details, I'm just briefly mentioning this. Uh, and I think there has been a shift in the last decade uh, in, in what many people consider to be political performance, which in a way very simple and very obvious, just tries to put these two things together. So, so, so to have a bigger focus on the form, uh, on the aesthetics, on the political implication of the aesthetics, and at the same time, very directly wanting to tackle political issues, which was a bit out of fashion uh, at, at some moment. So just, um, it will become a bit more clear when I talk about uh, the examples. But I think, uh, for me, uh, a development in, 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 perf in performing arts in the last more or less decade uh, very much um, brings these things together. And that is to, to see theater as assembly because that's basically what theater is. It is an assembly, people come together, uh, and how can, can, how can political issues be negotiated in this? And there's been many artistic approaches. I will show some of them. You can see many of these at Documenta at the moment, of course, so I will show some others. Uh, and of course, it's not by coincidence that, um, uh, that this, this interest in assemblies uh, in, in arts has been parallel, or maybe a little bit later, but ba basically parallel to an interest in assemblies worldwide uh, in the last decades. I have here now the, in, uh, the image of Occupy Wall Street, but all the square occupations, as you know, in Tahrir Square in Egypt and then in Spain and uh, later in Japan and in Moscow and all over the world, you all know it. So it has been a decade of activism which was very much focused on assemblies. And I think this also changed in the last, is changing in the last years due to many issues. So maybe, in a way, maybe I'm talking also about something uh, that is already a little bit in the past. That's something I'm also trying to figure out. I mean, it's still happening, but something is changing. But this, these moments of assemblies really very much um, uh, coined the, the, the last decade in many ways. Um, and just to mention it, uh, to see, talk, when we talk about artistic examples of assemblies in a moment, what... Uh, what is the difference between an uh, uh, activist assembly and an artistic assembly, uh, even though they might very much overlap at many moments? Um, and I think I just um, um, want to say like, that um, many of these artistic assemblies and many of the activist assemblies are influenced very much by an anarchist, in Western tradition, anarchist tradition of assemblies. Occupy Wall Street was very much uh, influenced by that. And uh, what is interesting and what was part of the interest is, of course, that already with Occupy, you could see in many other assemblies, you could see a lot of theatricality in there already. So in a way, you could say, OK, there's already a performance. If you think of the human mic, the repetition of things that are being said by the, by the whole group, that's an amazing performance, uh, which was collectively devised. It had a pragmatic reason, because no electric amplification was allowed, but it became a performance where you have to embody something, somebody says something and the whole group repeats it, that means it goes also for your body. You embody this. You, you, maybe before you think about, do I agree, do I disagree, you first have to repeat it in a way. Of course, you can chicken out or not do it, but, but it's, a, it's, it's a performative act or the hand signs, etc. So there are many theatrical moments in there. Uh, but I think the most important thing maybe is the, is the importance of the, uh, of the bodily presence. Uh, uh, in this. And there's the beautiful quote, um, which I like just to read by Judith Butler, who gave a famous speech at Occupy Wall Street, which later turned into a, a book. And she said, uh, it matters that as bodies we arrive together in public. As bodies we suffer, we require food and shelter. And as bodies we require one another in dependency and desire. So this is the politics of the public body, the requirements of the body, its movements and its voice. We sit and stand and move as the popular will, the one that electoral politics has forgotten and abandoned. But we are here, time and again, persisting, imagining the phrase, we the people. 
So maybe there's a bit of Anglo-Saxon pathos behind it, but it's quite beautifully put. What, what would be something that, of course, many people working in dance theater performance would also consider the, the key element in, of the medium, uh, so, so that the bodily presence is, is, is important in this. So, but with all these similarities, I would say there's a crucial difference in most of the activist assemblies and what I would consider a, uh, um, an artistic uh, assembly, or at least a theatrical assembly, or assembly in theater. And that is, is that uh, very often, uh, or, or in, in a way, these assemblies are um, also based on a, on a quite uh, deep belief on, on a certain kind of authenticity. So, uh, so, so the, 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 the assembly, the general assembly, should be an, in a way authentic place of coming together, of, of living, also not only of imagining another world, not of, of what could happen, but living it already. So it's performative in a Butlerian sense already, because you, by assembling you already do something differently. I think that's an important part of the documenta as well. Um, but but that, that brings a strange relationship to the question of authenticity in it. And, and um, this is I w what I would say that m the examples I will show have a, as theater in general, a maybe more complex relationship with the term authenticity. Uh, I would say theater is not as many post-structuralist, etc. approaches in the, in, in, in the 90s and zeros are, is like completely skeptic uh, against authenticity and saying everything is constructed. So theater wants authenticity, but at the same time is deeply skeptical towards it. So it's like an, it's an ambivalent or even maybe paradoxical medium in, in this. And I think for me that's one of the key, key elements of what, what theater and performance can be. So uh, I would say that theater and theater as assembly uh, takes, takes a different approach exactly in this question of authenticity and, and truth, if you want. So theater is a paradoxical machine that allows us to observe ourselves in a situation while we are outside of it. Uh, so it does not create a pure uh, outside criticality, but neither is able to really lure audience into a completely immersive situation. So you're always in and out, in a, or should be. <laughs> I think that or that's in the core of the medium, that there's an in and out situation of it. Uh, so, so essentially, theater is a medium uh, marks a space where things are real and not real at the same time. They are, they are actual and symbolic at the same time, uh, which is very, I mean, in a way, very banal, but also extremely complicated or complex. Uh, you have it even uh, in the, let's say, in the most conventional theater. You have it uh, uh, when, when an actor comes on stage and says, I'm Hamlet. Everybody knows this is whatever Harry Miller. Uh, pretending to be Hamlet, and at the same time you accept the role. So you already have this double take of permanently be, to be between uh, um, narration and uh, or fiction and facts uh, in a way, and, and uh, actual and symbolic as a, as a um, in German, it's a vexier build. I don't really know what the English translation is. Um, so this is in the, in the core of, of, a, of a certain Western theater tradition, but it's highlighted, of course, by certain theater makers and, and theorists like, like Brecht. So it's also very Brechtian what I'm saying. The whole alienation effect in Brechtian theater is exactly this. Permanently showing you, no, this is a constructed situation while the story is of course at the same time trying to draw you in. So, so I think that's, that's um, uh, maybe for me that would be what, what theater, performance, dance uh, can, can offer to, to this realm of political political art, which which is uh, I think um, different from from what many visual art approaches offer, but also what activism offers, of course, in a in a in a, in a specific way. Um, I just let me see. No, no, no. Uh, uh, okay, I can't go back. Uh, oh, sorry, this. I don't know, but this is just running in the back. Uh, it's also not so important. It's just, uh, um, I think it, it's, a, it's a project I was involved in curating called Truth is Concrete, which happened um, pretty much exactly 10 years ago from now. And I just wanted to show it because I think it's also, it's interesting to see that I think in these 10 years, the relationship between art and politics quite, quite changed. I mean, it was in a moment where actually a lot of artists were still, and 
definitely not Tanya, uh, but other artists were still quite struggling. What what is the relationship between my artistic practice and my political work? Is it like like talking to people, um, demonstrating and fighting in Tahir Square. So what do you do as an artist there? And it was a permanent conversation. Do I stop being an artist now? And now I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a citizen and now I fight and then I go back and then what do I do with it and then I reflect on it or is it even allowed? I remember many discussions at this time even is it allowed then to speak about the revolution or is, is that not does not mean that you appropriate the revolution that which you are not supposed to own even if you were part of it. So it was quite a time where I think it was much more confusion than uh, than now about these topics, not that it's solved now, but it was really an urgent topic. And uh, so we, we also decided in the festival, I, I used to work at that time, Steirischer Herbst in Graz, a multidisciplinary festival, to suspend the normal program and invite people uh, at that time for, uh, um, that was a one-week one non-stop day and night marathon program of, of negotiating these, these things. Uh, so that was a, um, an approach to... to um, yeah, to create an assembly in a moment where actually many things were still possible. I think we had many people in there that would also probably now not come together anymore in one space. So the, the, the conflicts also have risen in this time. Uh, it, was it was also a moment where there was, just to say how fast things change, we, we started to, to, um, to think about this program before Occupy Wall Street began. So we started to think, uh, we started organizing it when... There was the demonstration in, in Spain and then in Greece and, and of course in, before in Egypt and Tunisia and so on. And then we were still programming it and Occupy Wall Street began. And then we were finally doing it and Occupy Wall Street was already over. So, so just to say like also how fast these things changed and, and also how, how much then it was already an up and down of moods. So, so Occupy was already removed from square, but then suddenly at this moment it happened in Taksim Square in, in Turkey. And there was actually demonstrations in Russia, who uh, are unbelievable from today's point of view. So, so, so it was already a moment where it was clear it was not pure optimism and euphoria, but it was also still uh, had a certain dynamic. So just um, to mention this in terms of... Um, uh, yeah, of, 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 of time passing. And maybe also to mention this briefly in terms of uh, form and, and content that I mentioned. Um, and and, and it, was an, it was an important question for us also, how, to, how can you cur curate such a moment? How can you as an art institution invite activists and, and theorists uh, and artists from all over the world uh, what, what, what is this moment? Is that legitimate? Is it necessary? And so on. So this was something we were also quite, quite busy with. And, and our way of solving it at that time, and I'm, I think it, today it would be completely different, so it's not about that was a solution, but that's how we tried to uh, try, uh, tackle it, was um, by creating two different situations in a way. So we had a camp-like situation, which was very open, where there was a lot of space where people could just do what they want. They could announce their own program. We would announce it as if it would be our program and so on. But at the same time, we had a quite rigid, uh, let's say this was a horizontal structure in there. At the same time, we had a quite rigid vertical, oops, <laughs> vertical <laughs> situation of a marathon that was really running 140 hours nonstop. There was no break. Uh, in this. So one thing after the other. So, so that meant, and we didn't run late. So if, if, you, if, you, if you see that you're already late now for uh, more than half an hour, uh, you can understand what does it mean in 140 hours not to run late, means that you have a very rigid curatorial stru structure. That means like, no, this has to stop now, the next thing comes. So we kind of purposely produced a tension that showed that there's an institution doing it. We might be personally also some of us activists or whatever, but, but the institution is not an activist assembly. The institution is an art institution with certain agendas, hierarchies, um, financial system, etc. So, so we didn't want to hide it. And that was maybe, for, at least for me, always an important thing. And maybe with the things that I will show that, that it was all, that not, that this, this double take that I talk about of being inside and outside at the same moment is also produced by, by some, let's say, some walls or some frictions that are produced in, 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 the, in the work, aesthetically or curatorially. So, but uh, now coming to, um, uh, to a work which maybe then 
slowly makes clear what I, I'm trying to say. Um, this is a work by Dutch uh, um, uh, theater maker Lotte Vandenberg called Building Conversation. It's a project that's ongoing since, um, uh, I don't know, since almost 10 years, since eight years, uh, and also now done is by a group of people, not only by her. And what Lotte tried to do was, she, she was interested in what is essential in theater. If I take everything away, which is nice to have in theater, and what, what is left? So, and, and for her, it was, okay, I can take away actors, I can take away stage, I can uh, take away narration, I can take away um, acting, everything. Uh, but, but what is in the core is a conversation with people that follow certain rules. So it's both. Like, it's a conversation, but it's also rules. Uh, and, and by this already, it can mark a space of theater. And that's basically this project. That's, that's actually what it is. It is, you buy a ticket, for a certain conversation. So she, she looked for different conversation rules and structures all over the world um, by quantum physicist David Bohm, but also um, by Jesuits, uh, by um, one was in, inspired by Chantal Mouffe and so on. So, so different ways of having a conversation as a group. And you would come and buy a ticket and then this conversation would happen. So in a group maybe as large as, uh, as this group that is sitting here, somebody would explain um, what are the, the rules of this conversation? Sometimes there would be a topic. Sometimes maybe the topic would have to be found together, depending on this kind of rules. Sometimes there would be a moderator. More often there might, probably would be not a moderator. And then you're there with it, and, and you, have to, you have to do it or not to do it. Uh, and it was really quite, uh, participating in some of these, it was really quite an interesting experience, because what it made clear is that the responsibility here is not only with the artist, or actually maybe not even at all anymore, because she might not be there even. So, so, so you're left alone with it, which brings, which clearly shifts the idea of responsibility immediately. Because you can say, okay, I don't care. I think it's ridiculous. I don't want to take part. I don't want to have this conversation. Oh, Siri is also talking. Um, uh, so, so, so you can you can refuse it, but you're a small group. Uh, people bought a ticket. You're in a room. So, do you walk out, or do you feel a, a certain pressure? Uh, uh, and 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 also during this conversation, like uh, immediately you have this what I described, and that's maybe also what I would say Marx is a theater, not as a therapy session or whatever. Is you, you understand you are in an artificial situation. So, so you think about like why is he talking all the time and she is not to make a cliche situation, but, uh, but wh why, why am I talking in a certain way? Why I don't say something? Why is the conversation going this direction? Can I shift it? It becomes boring. Do I leave or do I have to change it? Is it boring because I'm not doing it? And, and, and. I mean, all simple questions. We all know it from, uh, from, from daily life experiences. But uh, through this frame, by calling this, con uh, uh, this theater, suddenly this, this conversation or these questions became, became obvious. So that's may, the most reduced form of theater of assembly that I think that, that kind of um, shows these, uh, these things. And one could say, of course, um, I already mentioned Brecht and others and uh, Boal and so on. Uh, you could say that uh, Lotte's work, of course, is, is, is following these footsteps. And especially maybe there's uh, an, a sentence by Brecht from the uh, short organ of so theater from, from 40... 49, uh, where he writes, uh, I, I quote it directly, the theater as we know it shows the structures of society on stage as incapable of being influenced by the society in the audience. So Brecht already made this division to say, okay, so what we, sh what we are shown in political theater is how society is functioning, but we have no way as audience, as the society, to influence it. Uh, and I think this is the... this. This problem posed in the 40s is basically the one that still theater makers work on in political theater till to, to, to today. Uh, no. I will not. Uh, I will um, not to take too much time. Like uh, just uh, say, of course. Um, 
questions of representation are always a, in, in, a key in theater. I mean, in art generally, but theater is all about representation, which, as you can imagine, brings theater in a very difficult situation with all the crisis of representation that we have since uh, since since many years, of course, but but recently enhanced. So, so what, who can who can represent whom on stage? I mean. Can an actor, can a white middle class actor represent a refugee on, on stage to make it very cliche, but it continues. Can a, can a man uh, represent a woman? Can anybody represent anybody else on stage? Even, and can you self represent yourself on stage? And what does that mean? And so, so it's, a, it's a question that will never end. So theater is, and I would say, in, uh, what I quite like is the analogy to, to the uh, problems of democracy that we have. Uh, it will always be in the dilemma of having to represent, there's no theater without representation, as at least I would argue with some others, there's no democracy with the representation, and this representation will always be problematic. It will, it, it will be also always illegitimate in a way. And, and again, theater is exactly the medium in this dilemma, in this paradoxical situation where it basically cannot do anything right, but that's the right thing or the right place to be, um, so to say. Um, I will, I will show this one. Um, in terms of uh, representation, uh, w w uh, some of the works of the, again, by chance, Dutch artist, Jonas Stahl, uh, have been exploring this, this question for me most radically in, in, in recent years, uh, especially a project called New World Summit, uh, where, where Jonas uh, brought they try to, to create assemblies, parliaments, quasi-parliamentary situation with people that are uh, excluded from, from the official democratic discourse, which very often means basically people that are considered to be terrorists uh, because then you are out of, the, out of the system. It's different from being a normal criminal because uh, the whole system, as you know, around terrorist lists uh, is, is, is very complex, so you sh very often you, it's not clear what are the rules to get on the list, it's not clear who makes the rules, it's not clear who decides, often it's not even clear who is on the list, you don't even know when you're on the list, it's impossible to get off the list, etc., and there are several of them. Uh, I don't need to go into it, but you can see this, this uh, project was very much still influenced by uh, the so-called war, war on terror after 9-11. Um, so what, what Jonas interested was, how can it be uh, that uh, that there's an exclusion from the democratic, from the democratic system, from the laws. So how can it be that you say, okay, this problem we cannot handle within our laws. We have to handle it outside of it, in Guantanamo, etc. Uh, so, so this was basically the question and the idea to to find a space of representation um, uh, uh, for 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 people that are in organizations, in illegal organizations, in this regard. Um, I will not go too much into it, uh, um, but just say a couple of things. One thing is important for me, that this was not a space where you were supposed to agree with everything. I think there was a lot not to agree, even amongst the people. Like, of course, the question of um, um, violent resistance, the question of patriarchy, the question of nationalism uh, in, in many of these organizations and so on. Uh, um, uh, mostly, most of them were independence organizations, so, so liber liberation organizations that he invited. Uh, so there are many things even amongst this group because sometimes, of course, there are also overlapping interests in terms of territory and so on. So it's not a space where it's about, about agreeing, but it was a space uh, where it was first about hearing of cer certain issues and trying to understand them before maybe dismissing them, and maybe afterwards dismissing them. It was not about uh, the, uh, um, yeah, calling for, for agreement. Um, and I think this was actually, uh, and I would say, uh, artistic assemblies are very much, uh, in terms of what makes them artistic also, very much connected to the idea of radical imagination. So there was a radicality in this imagination what what in this case the problematic term democracy could be. Uh, I, I have this photo here, which is from uh, uh, the Berlin Biennale in 2012, where the first summit happened. Uh, and it's, of course, the set design and not the thing. It happened in a theater in Sophienseele in Berlin. And I, I use this image because, it, again, it's also about this inside-outside construction because it was a clearly artificial situation. I mean, the set itself didn't look much different from maybe, maybe another one. No, I don't have a... 
photo here of the set. Maybe you see it a little bit here in the background. So it was it's the same kind of neat ma but makeshift uh, installation. So a very artificial situation. It was a theater situation. So um, uh, the, the flags were hung, uh, organized by color, uh, which is, of course, not a political or a geographical uh, way of organizing. I mean, with the red, maybe it's a political, but otherwise it's not necessarily a political uh, way of organizing it. Uh, so it's an artificial moment again to show this is an artificial situation. At the same time, it is a very real situation. Everybody speaking in there was a representative of these organizations. It was their struggles, their lives. There were no actors. There was no, I mean, there's performing as I perform now, but there was no performing in different roles. So, so again, this, this switch between artificial and actual, uh, I think, was, is one thing that made, made this a powerful, and at least in my, uh, in my view, a powerful work. Um, I just show uh, briefly this, just to mention it. There's a step that Jonas made, one could say maybe outside of this artistic realm. He actually built a, a, um, a parliament space in Rojava, uh, in, in, in the Kurdish area in, in, in Syria, which is used as a, as a public space, as a, as a quasi parliamentarian space. So, there, so, of course, the, the borders, the shifting between activism, political work, artistic work is is fluent um, uh, in many ways. What I just very briefly would want to say um, is that, that for me in thinking about uh, a theater as assembly or assemblies generally, uh, it was always quite important the, uh, to use the notion of, art, uh, of agonistic pluralism by Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau and other theorists. Uh, which is quite an interesting notion in terms of theater, I would say. So basically, to put it very simple, um, what, what, what Chantal Mouffe says is uh, um, basically that you need an ag agonistic sphere where you disagree to avoid an antagonistic sphere. So she, she, argue against, she argues against uh, the idea of consensus. So there would be already also a conflict with, uh, for example, Occupy Wall Street and many movements that, that uh, consensus-based movements in there. So she argues against consensus because she says it just ignores the differences. There always will be differences, and we might like them or not, but there's not one solution. One must understand that many, many of uh, especially liberal left theory in the past had the idea that at a certain moment, one could reach an agreement. In a way, communism is one of these solutions. So in the end, we have communism and then things are done. In a way, you could say that Habermas has this idea, uh, Rawls and other philosophers have the idea that, uh, that after deliberation and so on, and if we all get better and smarter and, and more responsible, that at a certain moment, uh, yeah, there could be consensus. What uh, Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau said basically, this is very nice, but will not happen. Uh, there will be always different opinions, also because there is not one solution, not only because we have different approaches, but there's not only one solution. So, so we need a sphere where these things can be acted out, uh, which uh, uh, move calls agonistic pluralism. And agonism is um, in, in contradiction to the term of antagonism. So antagonism is basically, well, um, if you just can hit uh, civil war or whatever. So antagonism is if there's no common space anymore. It's completely antagonistic. Agonism is a situation where adversaries that might, never might agree and will, will fight, uh, it's also a, a, a Gramsci concept, will fight for hegemony, so for whatever it takes. But still it's possible to do this, to agree on some rules that, that keep it together. Basically. And, and, and in the Muffian, I mean, I'm simplifying a lot, but in the Muffian way, this, this would be what democracy has to do. This is quite a hard concept because that means that a lot of things are being said or done or fought for, which we might completely disagree with. So, so it's also something, of course, the question, where does it end? What, what, uh, uh, yeah, wh where do we say, no, stop, this doesn't belong into this arena anymore. This has to be negotiated. But generally, it is about creating this, um, these situations. And I think um, for me, this has to be always a quite, quite good um, way of thinking of uh, political theater uh, uh, because, because not by chance the term agonism comes from agon, which is the competition, also the competition of arguments in Greek tragedy. So it has a certain theater line. Uh, and I think a lot of theater makers are also inf very influenced by this concept. Um, I'm just 
I don't know if this will start. If not, doesn't matter. It's, an image is also fine. Just one example would be um, uh, many works of the theater maker Milo Rao. Uh, who, if you know his work, he has a lot of stage works, which I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about, but I'm talking about a, a special branch of his work, which was actually really staging assemblies, staging trials. Uh, uh, this is one of these works, uh, one of the earliest he did in this case, it's, it's called the Moscow Trials. And what he did, he brought in the Sakharov Center in Moscow together um, on three days. He well, not reenacted, it was not a repetition, but um, what is the English term? Like, like an appeal when you have to do the trials again, you know, like it's a, it's a renewed trials of three of the three uh, most uh, crucial uh, trials against artists in Russia in the early 20th century, 21st century. So two trials against exhibition in Moscow that were um, um, dealing with religion and they were uh, stopped and people were um, uh, accused because of blasphemy. And the third one being the famous trial against Pussy Riot, so also a trial about religion. So these three trials um, would be set up in the Sakharov Center on three days with protagonists of all of these three trials. So artists, uh, orthodox activists, uh, reactionary TV moderators, uh, critics, etc., would come together and, and uh, perform these trials on three days, which was a, um, well, the film doesn't, doesn't work, but um, which was quite an intense situation, as you can imagine, because for many people, life changed. They went to prison or uh, there were suicides uh, in this context and so on. So it's a tough situation to relive this. So it was an interesting moment also to see how important, I mean, these people were in a situation where they all knew it's an artificial situation. This doesn't change anything on a legal base. Uh, but everybody was involved in this um, as if it was for real. And, and the, 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 the right-wing side as well as the artists uh, and, and, and um, the art-related people in there. Uh, so, so uh, exactly this double take again an artificial, between an artificial situation and a real situation was, was, was very strong there. It kind of ended, it ended with the, the jury, which was also set up by uh, people from different uh, parts of society, uh, with, um, th that they were even, so there was no decision. Uh, the jury could not reach a decision, and by this, art was acquitted, so art won in a way, but not. In also not really, because it was just because there was no verdict. There was one vote for a verdict missing. Uh, so it quite showed also, I think, a situation in, in Russia at that time. And already then one could say, and this maybe goes for, for several works uh, in this regard, uh, this could only happen in the space of art at that time. Uh, already it could not have happened somewhere else anymore. And after this, also it could not happen, as we know now, also not happen in the space of art anymore. But sometimes there are these moments where it's an in-between possible, uh, in, in, where because of the as if, um, which is an interesting thing uh, in terms of, uh, again, the question of symbolic and actual, uh, is that there's an assumption in theater of the as if, of the fiction, that allows you to do certain things that you cannot do outside. Um, well, in Germany, obviously, you cannot walk in a Nazi uniform through the street, but you can wear a Nazi uniform on stage. So that's exactly the, the legal differentiation in there. With the example of UNASTAL that I showed you of the New World Summit, the flags that were shown there that were of illegal organizations, he wanted to hang out some of the window of KW, uh, the, the art institution in Berlin, which was forbidden because these are illegal flags, but inside of KW they could be shown. So just to show this, this, this double take also might have legal implications which don't help in Russia at the moment or in in, in situation where where uh, uh, yeah where it doesn't help obviously anymore. But but it's a it has also to do with this with this paradoxical double take I'm talking about. Um, okay, this was the film. Um, I skip this and. Um, uh, want to talk um, uh, uh, as a last part about the concept of pre-enactment, which I find quite quite important or, or helpful also when thinking about uh, theater as assembly or art as assembly. Pre-enactment is a term uh, coined by in different words by, by several artists. Uh, sometimes it's called prefiguration, uh, and 
in this in this case the term is I take the term from uh, Israeli uh, performance and research group public movement which was taken on by political politologist Oliver Marchart uh, who, who uses it a lot uh, and generally pre-enactment obviously is the opposite of a reenactment so in, while in reenactment reperforms recreates the situation in the past uh, very very popular in Hungary, Poland, and other, in the, but also in England and US. With different sites are historic reenactments of whole battles. So you reenact war battles um, uh, to I don't know to feel how it was or something like this. Uh, so so, uh, but of course you have reenactments also in performing arts, um, reenacting a performance by Yoko Ono, or Abramovich, or etc. is part of the repertoire. So pre-enactment would be the opposite. Pre-enactment would be artistically doing something that will happen in the future, which, which sounds a little bit like magic. Um, but, but I think the idea is, or as Oliver Marchert would explain it, the idea is in a way to train for something, to train for situations that come in the future. Because a political situation, a political moment happens without being predictable. You don't know when, whatever, the revolution will happen. A political moment never happens in the moment when everybody thinks it happens. That's at least the theory. So you have to be prepared for something. Oliver Marchardt uh, describes it even with the situation of a, of a ballet dancer that trains on the, on the bar uh, for whatever choreography might come. So it's a bit of, uh, so you see, it's a bit of vague definition. That's why different artists also use it in different ways. But the idea is basically to create situation, to try out something, that could become useful in the future. Um, I just, uh, I will not go into this one. This is a work by public movement uh, called Make Art Policy, which was done in Helsinki and in Düsseldorf in different situations where it was about a parliamentary situation inviting actual politicians uh, to, to, to discuss cultural policy. But I, I will not go into it um, just to sh but show the the question of reenactment maybe with two other examples that both dealt with the World Climate Conference in Paris about ten, eight years ago. Um, the two works I'm, I want to show is, uh, or shortly uh, touch upon is one by Rimini Protocol, a theater, theater group, uh, theater makers uh, from Germany um, and in Switzerland that took the idea of the pre of the a climate, world climate conference by assigning to the whole audience, uh, to the whole audience, a, st a certain state that they would represent. So, so um, 670 audience members, uh, which represented actually more or less the same number that would be also in, in, in the climate conference in Paris, would represent, uh, I have to look it up, 196 nation states that would be part of this conference, and they would have. Uh, let's say they would argue from the point of view of this nation. So they would say, okay, we only live from oil, so what can we do? So we have to fight for oil, but we also see there's a problem. Others um, live in countries which are already devastated or being devastated by the climate change. They will have a different position. So trying to find a situation where people argue from all these positions. So that was uh, basically, and then uh, come to an agreement in the end. So this was a... You would say, um, I, this, I would say it's clearly not a pre-enactment, that's rather, and it's, that's not a judgment, but it's a way of trying to understand what is happening. Why does this climate conference end in a way it usually ends, uh, by, by, by understanding the structures and the way of argumentation. There was another um, example uh, by theater maker Frédéric Aituati and uh, um, philosopher Bruno Latour, uh, which tried actually, and they called it also pre-enactment, to find a completely different way of having a climate conference. And it was influenced by uh, Bruno Latour's uh, concept of theater of, uh, uh, of parliament of things. So the idea, how can there be representation, to come back to the representation topic from the beginning, how can there be representation not only to human actors and players, or actants, as uh, uh, Latour calls them, uh, but also to a mountain, a river, uh, um, uh, air, uh, flowers, etc. So, so how can these agencies be in the room? How can, how can there be a parliament where everybody speaks? Um, Frédéric Aituati speaks quite openly about it, that this was, of course, not a success at all in terms of functioning well, because it's, 
I mean, you can already imagine that this is not a solvable problem, uh, but it was very, that it was very successful and intense in actually trying to do things differently, as a, to pre-enact, to be prepared, to train for a possibility that things might, uh, might change. Um, so, just, so these are two approaches to the, towards the same topic or the same format of assembly uh, with quite different um, ways of doing it. I will come to an end uh, um, by just maybe mentioning uh, when we talk about training, pre-enactment as training, uh, a project that uh, Jonas Stahl, the artist that I already mentioned, and I'm doing together since a couple of years called Training for the Future, where we actually also thought about what is the role how to what comes after the assembly or how can certain maybe um, dead ends of certain assemblies be overcome or how can we prepare for for what is coming and so we we had um, several editions of a project called training for the future now which plays with the idea that we invite different trainers artists activists to to uh, share skills of how they try to, to shape the future. So it's not only being prepared like in a prepper way for whatever will come, but also to, to actually uh, negotiate alternative uh, ways of doing things. And, and the training as a concept is of course also, as many things that I'm mentioning, I think ambivalence is, 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 is something that is in many of these things or a certain paradox, because the training has a, a military touch to it, or at least a sports touch to it. It has the idea that there's a trainer, we have trainers that train others, so there's a hierarchy involved and so on, so it brings these problems with it. Uh, but it's also a moment which we are interested in where you actually have to follow a proposal first, a bit like uh, what I was saying about um, the human mic. You first have to do it and then you can disagree because otherwise it doesn't, I mean, you, you can just leave, of course, but uh, if you're there, there's no audience uh, perspective. You, you either join in and train together and then say, I disagree or not, but it doesn't make sense not to follow the proposal and, and to, uh, to postpone the critique, which of course comes for a moment uh, in this, but also that it is a bodily experience. So the train, of course, a lot of the trainers are also usually giving seminars and talking a lot like, uh, but, uh, but the training itself has, is something that always also embody, you embody something. You're part of it, not only in a discursive way, but also at, as a, in a certain group structure, group dynamics play a role and so on. So it's something we are experimenting with. And of course, in terms of the hierarchies, the trainers of one training are the trainees in the other training. So there's also a way that this is permanently changed. And it's um, not to say this, that this is necessarily the format of the future, but it's a way for us to, uh, to try out uh, certain uh, certain things in a different way. Yeah, there was maybe just to show briefly this, uh, or let it run for a moment, um, because of course many things I'm talking about now are, are obviously based on bodily presence. They, that's how they function. Uh, and then the last two and a half years, or how long is it now? I lost track. Uh, we have not, we have noticed that well, bodily presence is something that is. Um, can become very difficult. Maybe sometimes it's also not necessary. There are other ways also to meet. Um, but but uh, this is something newly to negotiate. And we, we did one edition of Training for the Future, while the other editions really are about bringing people together and being in one space for a couple of days and have, having all, the, the, all these group dynamics. We did one edition which was completely decentralized. So it was happening in the Philippines, in Colombia, in uh, South Africa, uh, in Italy and, and so on, but um, at the same moment, but actually Jonas and me were, were at none of these, so they happened completely decentralized with their own rules, with their own way of doing it. And, and what was interesting is the only rule we gave basically was it has to be analog. There's no Zoom involved. Uh, so that meant also that negotiating what is possible can we have 50 people or can we have two people? Can we be close to each other or far or do we wear masks or whatever? It was completely decentralized and everybody solved it differently. But actually it was in a way forcing a certain analog situation at a certain moment where every, all of the groups we were working with were saying like, oh wow, this is, um, we, we, we wouldn't have done that or we don't, know, we don't know two days before what we actually can do or not. So, so this was an ex interesting experiment in this way. I would say. I um, 
skip the the rest. Knowledge production is also very important, but I will not talk about it. And um, just maybe finish by saying, if you're interested in it, there's an archive, an online archive of uh, lectures and conversations on on the art of assembly, on theater as assembly, where, well, Tanya Bugera is also in one of the conversations and many others, uh, Judith Butler and many other, Jonas Stahl that you saw on Lotte Vandenberg and so on, the, um, where we kind of try to gather, gather these, these thoughts and these negotiations. And now I stop the, the marathon. Thanks so much for, for listening. And uh, if there are any questions or comments, please, uh, maybe there's even a microphone for that, or you can have this one. Thank you. There's a microphone, yeah. <laughs> so I have to go up. Oh, okay. All right, uh, my name is Ariel Brock. I am a uh, Norwegian artist living in Berlin. Uh, I noticed you said many, many a time, negotiate. You, you, many of the sessions you described were in them, negotiation was a part of what was going on, I think, yes? So my question would be, did those, do you have an example of an outcome of these negoti negotiations. Because I think you, if you nego negotiate, then you are, you are aiming at something, you know? Different parties taking part in the negotiation may have different aims. And if the neg negotiation is successful, then there is an outcome. So. Yeah, so that's my question. Well, that's that's always the um, uh, the yeah the, the question is is it successful in in a way and does art have an effect here? Uh, I would say it's difficult to say. I, there are examples. The the Make Art Policy um, Parliament in 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 Helsinki uh, is considered by many many artists and activists in Helsinki as an important part in stopping the Guggenheim branch in Helsinki. I don't know if it's true or not, but like uh, people would say this was an mo important moment of bringing the artistic community together in, and, and actually having a political impact. I would say uh, in mo many of these projects, the negotiation is maybe more, it's already, it's maybe more about making it happen at all. So the, the, the outcome is that it happens, that certain people are in one space and taking part of it uh, and this is already sometimes a state of exception towards something else uh, in, in other cases yes I don't know Bruno Latour's Parliament of Things if it will have an outcome on the long run together with many other projects and books one one will know one day I, I think it's difficult it's difficult to say uh, these are also I think in terms of art and activism I think there there are examples of activist art which are much more related to a certain outcome and also much more aim for something certain to, and I didn't talk about these because I think these kind of assemblies often are more about negoti yeah, negotiating how assemblies can be. So, so the, them happening is, is already what, what is happening in a way, less than, than something, less than a certain activist or artist activist um, direct action against a certain thing that then happens or doesn't happen where you can say, worked or didn't work. I have this one. Does it, does it work? I think so. Yeah. Um, I am actually a physicist, and there's someone who has also done uh, 30 years of uh, amateur theater work. And as a physicist, I see that you may be trying to do the phenomenology of assembly the dynamics of assembly, how to make assemblies more effective, understand how assemblies work and make them more effective. For example, solve the climate change problem through negotiation, which is a very difficult problem. And uh, that I think is admirable. Uh, if 
this is what you are trying to do. Uh, you will tell me. Um, as a theater person, I have an objection to the presentation you made where you said that theater is something that has a, um, an artificiality to it. You know, we theater people, and I think most of us who, who do theater, will say, hey, we're trying to create a reality. We're trying to make people feel a dramatic situation out of which they can draw some ethical conclusions of some sort or other. It may be political theater, it may be any other kind of theater. I don't see why you make this statement. Uh, and you used it as an example of how other forms of assembly can be better. I don't know. Or actually, no, you use it as an analogy. The same way theater is artificial, the same way everything is artificial. Is that true? Every form of assembly is artificial in the end. OK, I stop. Um, yeah, thank, I think um, I, I, that's an, that would be another question if everything is artificial. I think what, 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 what the theater I describe wants to, sh to show the artificiality in a way. And there is a disagreement with you. I would uh, totally see it. And it's an old disagreement. It's a dis disagreement that Stanislavski and Brecht had. Uh, so I would not know. You said the majority of theater makers. I would not give you this point. I don't know if it's the majority. Uh, but uh, I would say, yes, there are many theater makers that believe uh, in this creating of a world and, uh, and make believe. And there are, there are others that don't. And these are two branches since uh, at least 100 years, but probably longer, that go in different directions. Um, to, to just not go because yeah that, that that we can be two the two of us can discuss till tomorrow morning and we probably will not agree but just to say why i believe the strength it's less what people should do everybody can do what they want what i believe what the strength of the medium of theater towards other medium is is exactly that it, in my perce uh, perception is never completely immersive so i, I the idea um when I watch it, well, when I watch the cliche idea of a Hollywood movie or whatever, yes, I, I, I at a certain moment forget that I'm outside, I'm just in the film and so on. In theater, theater tries this, it doesn't work for me. So the, the door is shaking, the person is... So, so it, there's always a moment for me where I'm reminded of, of the reality around me and maybe the neighbor next to me and so on. And I don't see this as a, as a negative thing. I see this as the actual the potential of theater. And so some people in theater try to eliminate this moment of outside as much as possible, and others embrace it to say, this is actually what we can do. Uh, and, and that's, a, let's, in the end, an aesthetical, ideological also uh, difference. There's a lot of theater recently, or there's a rise of theater at the moment called immersive theater that really tries to create worlds where you're inside and, don't, and, and should not see anything of the reality outside anymore. Personally, I, I, I neither like it nor believe it, but, uh, but there's a strong, uh, there's a strong uh, reason. But, but, uh, so, so I'm but just to say one thing, I'm very obviously talking about the specific, probably very small segment of theater in, uh, today. And, and of course, there are many, many other approaches around. Are you trying to investigate the dynamics of assembly, understand how assembly can be done better? Yeah, some of them try to do it better. Others just try to understand why it's not what. Is, yes, well, I think better is a difficult term, but I, I, I'm really interested in the dilemma, also of representation. I think there are certain dilemmas we are, we, are, we, we need representation in arts and politics. Representation never, in, never can really work. So that staying with the trouble is is what also theatre I think is the best. Theatre for me is a medium to stay with the trouble, more than, than most other art forms, I would say. Um, so I'm, maybe I'm avoiding the answer, but, but I... All right, if there's no other comment, I think we, we set a long time. Thanks so much for, for joining.